Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with eight other New York mayors, anti-gun violence advocates, faith leaders, and elected officials to kick off Gun Violence Awareness Month in New York State. We gather here today to send a strong message. We will not give in to the terror of gun violence. We will never stop working to protect New Yorkers. Less than three weeks ago, the beauty of the Buffalo community was shattered when a racist outsider came to our city and gunned down 10 innocent people and injured three others. Today, as we continue to pray for the families who are hurting, we are also moving forward as a strong, loving community and turning our grief into action. I want to thank New York City Mayor Eric Adams for his partnership, along with the following mayors and leaders who are joining us this morning. Rochester Mayor Malik Evans, Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan, Westchester County Executive George Latimer, Mount Vernon Mayor Sean Patterson Howard, Newburg Mayor Torrance Harvey, Niagara Falls Mayor Robert Restaino, Dunkirk Mayor Wilfred Rosas, and Yonkers Mayor Mike Spano. Also joining us, um, and let me recognize them, Kay Bain, Executive Director, Community Capacity Development, Linda Beagle Shulman, Founder, Scott J. Beagle Memorial Fund, Reverend Paul Thomas, Pastor of Buffalo's Bethel AME Church. Gun Violence Awareness Month is an opportunity for all of us to acknowledge the pain and suffering gun violence has brought upon our communities, state, and nation. It is also a chance to amplify the stories of survivors and victims, the work of leaders and organizations, and most importantly, the solutions that can help drive gun violence out of our communities. Gun violence is not just a Buffalo or New York State problem, it's a national crisis. Over the last 17 days, we have continued to witness the dark reality of gun violence in America. From the mass shooting right here in Buffalo to the tragedy in Uvalde, Texas, plus an additional 24 lives lost across 10 states in other gun incidents, all totaled 65 deaths in less than three weeks. No matter the motivation of the person behind the weapon, this is the time we are standing up and saying no more. This is why I have partnered with Governor Kathy Hochul, the federal government, and local law enforcement to remove illegal guns off our streets and keep our community safe. Our efforts must increase to end gun violence. Among the black Americans polled in a recent Pew Research Center study, approximately eight in 10 said gun violence is the top concern facing their community. Today, in partnership with my fellow mayors and leaders on this call, we affirm and declare June as Gun Violence Awareness Month in our respective communities, a time dedicated to having discussions, raising awareness, and pushing for change. This weekend, June 3rd through June 5th, we will light the Buffalo City Hall and other government and private buildings in orange, the color of gun violence prevention, and we are asking other municipalities to do the same. We are calling for a weekend of faith, June 10th through June 12th, encouraging faith leaders across the state to deliver sermons on preventing gun violence 
in their community. Additionally, we are committed to using this period to pause and reflect on what's working and what's not, to ensure greater coordination at all levels of government and with leaders across sectors whose work touches this issue. It is now my pleasure to introduce New York City Mayor Eric Adams. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brown, and I thank all of my colleagues that are on uh, today. And this is something that we're all dealing with uh, in our cities. This is not a local problem, as Mayor Brown stated. Uh, the shooting that took place in Buffalo is no different than the shootings that take place on Buffalo Avenue in Brooklyn. All across the country, we are seeing mayors wrestle with how to address this overproliferation of guns in our cities. It is time for us to have a united fight against the overproliferation of guns. It tore my heart when I sat next to Mayor Brown in Buffalo on Saturday, watching a mother, a grandmother, a wife, laid to rest, not based on some chronic disease, but a chronic sickness of gun violence. Seeing her family and loved ones having to experience this is no different than the 11 month, 11 year old baby girl that was killed in the Bronx. But we're also watching our children kill children and our children being armed with these dangerous weapons. We saw in our school system, a young man bringing two fully loaded nine millimeter guns to school, just for the next day, another young man bringing a loaded weapon. One child was 15, another child was 13 years old. And we are on the verge of the Supreme Court passing a piece of law that would dictate open carry to allow people to openly carry guns in those cities where we have fought so long to ensure to have strong gun laws. There must be a national approach to this. There must be national solutions that include social media and how it is not using its communication ability to detect those who are being radicalized and eventually carrying out radical actions. It must include improvement, improvement on our ATF allotment of the agents. Right now, we only have approximately 24 agents, only 80 in New York City. We can't do the cross checking and gun tracing that we need. We have to zero in on ghost guns and ensure that we have legislation that treat these guns as actual guns that are assembled. And then we need to ensure that we give support to the local crisis management teams and organizations and groups that are also implementing preventive measures, not only reactionary measures. And lastly, mental health illnesses. We're witnessing this all over the country. Post COVID, it was a crisis. Pre COVID, it was a crisis. And we know it's a crisis post COVID. It's time to give the resources to our cities and states that will ensure that we can provide the necessary mental health care that far too many people need. Let's invest in people. Let's realize that this is a crisis that's impacting far too many families all across the country. It's not only eight case 47s, but it's also the large number of handguns that's the real enemy of our inner cities. And so I am here with the mayors of New York State. We take our hat off to the senators that are meeting today to have a real dialogue to find bipartisanship to address this issue. But we know as New York State mayors, that we have an obligation to protect the children and families of our city. And I thank all of my colleagues, my fellow mayors that are on this Zoom and this presser. And let's continue to align ourselves to the mission of keeping our city safe. Mayor Brown, thank you for your leadership in this area. And we continue, uh, we have the desire to continue to work with you. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Adams, and thank you for uh, your leadership. Thank you for your partnership, and thank you for your strong resolve on the issue of ending gun violence in our communities. Now it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Kay Bain, Executive Director of the Community Capacity Development for his comments. Thank you, Mayor Brown. I uh, want to extend thanks to Mayor Adams for his continued leadership in pushing forward a people-centered approach to this crisis as he described it. Uh, my name is Kay Bain. I am the founder, executive director of Community Capacity Development. We are a human justice and healing organization. And what that means is that we approach violence um, on three layers simultaneously. We look at community mobilizing and empowerment. We look at system change and we look at individual transformation. These three things have to happen simultaneously in order for there to be a transformative effect in communities. And our focus is communities of color, but we are again a human justice organization because we believe that gun safety is a human justice issue. In New York City, we have done some remarkable work around getting the community activated and involved. We've seen unprecedented success when we mobilize community with strategies and tools that we've worked on for quite some time. It's an honor. What does this mean for the nation? This means that we are raising the consciousness and awareness. This means that we're sending a signal around the country that we have to rehumanize what's happening in this country. We have to take time right now in this moment to focus on people who have been invisible for too long. It's not a coincidence that in Buffalo, we see some of the same challenges that we see in Brooklyn and Boston and other places where violence occurs in the form of food apartheid, in health disparities, in the public education system. I think what has to happen right now in this moment is a reinvestment in communities. I think we have to look at gun safety as a byproduct of marginalization and disenfranchisement. So I applaud the mayors who have come together here, the senators who will meet later to talk about some of these issues specifically but keeping our eye on the prize. In talking to the community in Buffalo, they are telling us they want to see self-defense and mental discipline. They want to see community mediation trainings. They want to see ways to interact and communicate on a higher level, in addition to addressing the influx of drugs and guns that come into communities. So if we're listening to community, if we're doing need assessments, which we are, if we're internalizing what's being said and operationalizing it, then we have an opportunity, we have an opportunity right now to do something transformative in communities that desperately need an effective change. Uh, thank you very much for your work, Kay Bain. Thank you for being with us today in Buffalo. We appreciate you sharing lessons learned uh, that your organization has used uh, to make a difference here in Buffalo and communities all across this country. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, it is now my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Linda Beagle Schulman, uh, founder of the Scott J. Beagle Memorial Fund. Thank you, Mayor Brown. My name is Linda Beagle Schulman. 1,568 days ago, my son was murdered in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School massacre in Parkland, Florida. Scott was shot six times within three seconds from five feet away. Incredibly, but all too true, at the same time, Florida, like Texas, considered an 18-year-old to be mature enough to buy an AR-15 assault rifle, a weapon of war whose only purpose is to kill people, but not mature enough to buy a beer. It is important for everyone here in Buffalo, along with any other community that has experienced gun violence, to understand that you are also victims of gun violence. Let me state again, you are all victims of gun violence. You must learn to accept that. All too often, those whose lives are ended by gun violence are considered to be the victims. The rest of us, the wounded, the family members, the friends and the coworkers, 
are incorrectly labeled survivors. Gun violence has a profound effect on the entire community, not only on those who are killed. We are all victims. We survive physically, but we are still victims. Look at me. No bullet pierced my body. I have no physical scars. I was not rushed into surgery or had to endure months of painful rehabilitation. However, the emotional and psychological scars that I have are just as real, just as painful, and will continue to last for the rest of my life. I am asking you, turn your grief, your pain, and your anger into activism. We must end gun violence through both education and legislation. Through education, the Scott J. Beagle Memorial Fund sends at-risk, underserved children touched by gun violence to summer sleepaway camp. Our goal is to show these impressionable and vulnerable young children that there are positive alternatives to guns and gangs and keep them out of the criminal justice system forever. I believe in gun safety, not gun control. We must fight for the enactment of the most basic gun safety laws, like the laws we have enacted here in New York. We must pass legislation on a federal level. This legislation should include universal background checks, safe storage, the banning of bump stocks, and the banning of ghost guns. This is plain and simple common sense. We are literally in the fight for our lives. The root causes of gun violence are many. They include white supremacism, mental health, illness, and also poverty, just for starters. But there is one common thread running through all of these causes of gun violence in our country, the easy access to guns. A white supremacist, hell-bent on evil, cannot undertake a mass shooting without easy access to an AR-style weapon. Everyone has the right to be safe, and everyone has the right to live without fear. No one should have to think about where they will hide if someone with a gun starts shooting. You should feel safe in a school, a supermarket, a house of worship, a movie theater, at a concert or a mall without the need to look over your shoulder. June is Gun Violence Awareness Month. It is outrageous that we have to designate a day for gun violence awareness, let alone a month, but we do. We have to keep up the fight and make our streets, homes, schools, places of worship and businesses safe from gun violence. Last week, I was asked about the lone gunman who walked into the school in Texas and took the lives of 19 innocent children who had not yet experienced all the joys of life, along with two teachers who sacrificed their lives trying to save their students. I stated then, and I will reiterate again, there is no such thing as a lone gunman. The gunman, for, for now who we know as the active shooter, is the one who pulled the trigger, but as far as I am concerned, the active shooter had help and encouragement from the NRA. The NRA continues to oppose basic gun safety measures as universal background checks and red flag laws, which we know very well saves lives. An active shooter had help and encouragement from the gun industry who continued to sell guns that they knew were full well for only one purpose. The purpose was to kill people. Clearly, the gun industry values profits more than they value human lives. The active shooter had help and encouragement from governors, lieutenant governors, state's attorney generals, state legislatures, and the 50 United States senators as they continue failing to enact reasonable gun safety laws. Right now, 50 United States senators are holding the entire country hostage by opposing reasonable gun safety legislation. The active shooter had help and encouragement from the United States Supreme Court, which seems to value guns over lives. New York has the most stringent gun safety laws in the country, yet we are not immune from gun violence. Illegal guns are coming into New York through the iron pipeline from the South every day. We must commit ourselves to ending gun violence in our lifetime. We must commit ourselves to the passage of reasonable gun safety laws on the federal level. We must keep up the fight. We must speak out and make sure our voices are heard loud and clear and taken very seriously. If we remain silent and do nothing, the epidemic of gun violence will only get worse. 
just look at where we are now. We must do our part. Before I return the microphone to Mayor Brown, I would like to leave anyone and everyone who is a victim of gun violence and listening to my voice, a few personal thoughts. We are entitled to our emotions, our feelings, our grief, our anger, our sadness. Our lives have been turned upside down and inside out. Our lives will never be the same. Many, many times I've been asked, when do you think you will get over or get past the sense of loss and grief you feel? Let me answer you right now. You never get over it. You never get past it. You find some days will be more difficult than others. Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays, holidays. For me, the hardest day is Valentine's Day, February 14th. February 14th is the day that my son was shot in Parkland. You see, February 14th is the day that Scott was murdered, and it's also the day that my daughter, Melissa, was born. February 14th, as you can imagine, is one of the happiest days of my life and also the worst day of my life. It has been 1,068 days since Scott's murder. I have had to learn to live with the loss and grief I feel each and every day. My son, my loved one, was murdered senselessly due to gun violence. For those of you in my club, the club no one ever asked to become a member, you will know that you have rounded the corner and begun your journey of recovery, of healing, when you're alone with your thoughts and the memory of your loved one pops into your head. This time, instead of tears welling into your eyes, the memory brings a smile to your face. Today, I love talking about my son. I love hearing stories. I love getting texts. I love getting letters. I love getting pictures from people who knew him and want to share. It is a very long journey to healing and learning to live with the devastating loss of a loved one. Yet we have choices. My choice has become my mission. My mission is to do something that will rid our society of senseless gun violence and make sure no other mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, friend, or coworker ever joins my club. Let's work together and put a sign on the door of my club that says membership closed, no more admittance. Join me on my mission, please. I know together we can make a difference and I know and I believe in my heart together we can get something done. Thank you, stay strong and stay safe. Linda Beagle Shulman, thank you for your powerful comments and for turning your pain into real action that's making a difference in the lives of others. Uh, we will now hear from elected leaders from all across the state of New York who will make their comments in the following order. Rochester Mayor Malik Evans, Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan, Westchester County Executive George Latimer, Mount Vernon Mayor Sean Patterson Howard, Newburgh Mayor Torrance Harvey, Niagara Falls Mayor Robert Restino, and Dunkirk Mayor Wilfred Rosas. Uh, now we will hear from Mayor Evans. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brown, for hosting this event. And um, I want to say we continue to pray for you, Mayor, um, Brother Mayor, and um, all of our brothers and sisters in Buffalo. Buffalo is extremely close to Rochester, as you know, 90 miles um, to the east. So our hearts are broken for our brothers and sisters in Buffalo. And I always say that we see ourselves in Mayor Brown because we see ourselves in the community of Buffalo. The victims of that horrific incident um, on May 14th represent a cross section of America. Um, a retired police lieutenant, uh, a substitute teacher, a beloved grandmother, a dedicated community activist. All these folks are representative of the gun violence that we're seeing um, in our communities. And I know that I'm tired of it and I know our fellow mayors are also tired of it. We owe it to um, survivors, to, to folks um, like Linda Beagle Schumann who just spoke, to not let our despair paralyze us and move into action. And I hope that um, as we continue to work, that, that, that work in prayers, I'm a preacher's kid, faith without work is dead, we just can't pray, we, gotta, we also have to work at it, we're, we'll be able to shine a, a shining light to lift our hearts um, during these difficult times that we're seeing and that we just saw in the last couple of weeks in Buffalo and in Texas. Um, it's exhausting, and I think that it's a crying shame that today in America, that we continue to see gun violence across the spectrum, and it, and it, and it is a punctuation point 
when we see that it's sometimes driven by hate and racism that, that costs predominantly African Americans um, their lives. And I hope that we can come up with sensible legislation that will get guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. I'm a banker and I'll, and I'll wrap up. I'm a banker. Um, so I, I look at the numbers. I look at the numbers. And in 2020, more Americans died of gun-related in injuries than any other year on record. And that includes the record, a record number of gun numbers. In 2020, even after all these mass shootings that we've had, Sandy Hook, Parker, that's 45,222 people dead from gun-related injuries, according to the CDC in one year. And again, I tell you, I, I'm a banker, so I, I, I go to the numbers and think that that would, would somehow wake folks in Washington up to action. There were 61 shooter incidents that killed 103 people and wounded 140 in 220. That's 243 casualties of active shooter instances in one year a 50% increase from the previous year and a 96.8 increase from 2017. So we, we have to keep speaking up. We have to keep speaking up, but we also have to demand action. And um, as it was said in Rochester, we'll be pro proclaiming um, uh, this week on Friday uh, with our county executive, um, you know, gun, gun Violence Awareness Month. We'll be wearing orange. We'll be lighting up our city orange. Um, I'm collaborating with our, with our school district. Um, this year alone, my first day in office, my first day is taking my, my, in office, my oath. I had a 14-year-old kid murdered while he was going to the store to buy noodles. A 17-year-old murdered while getting off the bus. A 10-year-old shot four times while she's braiding her grandmother's hair. So I'm collaborating with our school district because our young people are experiencing this trauma. And then they have to turn on the TV and see what's happening in Texas. It's hard for me to even explain to my kids who are the same age as the kids that were, that, that were murdered in cold blood in Texas, how do I explain to them what we are seeing? But in Rochester, we won't give in to this flare. We're gonna to continue to pledge to work with our law enforcement, our civic groups to find a path to the underlying causes that precipitate these instances. We have the mayor's advisor on violence prevention services. We launched the Rochester Peace Collective um, last month, which works to try to encourage our young people in particular to do positive things before they get involved in gun violence. The last thing I'll say is, when there's a hurricane or a natural disaster, FEMA comes in and we have this whole community approach where everybody comes in together to try to solve this natural disaster. Gun violence should be no different. In every level of government, every single organization needs to come together to try to do what we can to stop this carnage that we continue to see um, in our country and in our cities. And, and, and mayors, we live it. We don't, we don't get to stand up and talk and preach about it. We got to go to these mothers and fathers and these brothers and sisters and these kids and comfort them while we're seeing this. We, we don't get to get into esoteric conversations. The problems are right at the doorsteps of City Hall, and we need help. We can't do this alone by ourselves. So thank you, Mayor Brown, for pulling us together. I know that we will keep the faith, and we will keep moving forward. And, and I hope that 50 years from now, people will look back and say, this is the moment, this is the time where they finally did something in the richest, most powerful nation in the world to try to end the scourge of gun violence in our community. Thank you. Our Thank next speaker is Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan. Thank you, Mayor Evans, and well said. Uh, we need help, and Mayor Brown, um, you are having to utilize leadership skills that none of us ever want to have to utilize. Um, in I, our prayers are with you, um, and I, I am so grateful that Buffalo has a leader like you right now at this very dark time in its history. Um, and you are the right person in the right place. Uh, and, and thank you for your leadership on this issue and for calling us together as mayors to speak out against gun violence. Gun violence impacts every one of our communities. And notwithstanding the fact that we took a record number of guns off the street last year and we're doubling that pace this year, they continue to plague our community and cut down lives. And we need help at the federal level. As other speakers have said, we have some of the strictest gun laws in the country, common sense gun laws here in New York State, and yet we have this pipeline of guns coming into our community. Just last night, there was a drive-by shooting. Fortunately, the victim it looks like they are going to survive, but the injury will stay with them for the rest of their lives. And we picked up 17 shell casings from that shooting. 
We shortly after that shooting were able to pull over the vehicle involved in the drive-by where a 16-year-old was found with a gun magazine that could hold 15 bullets. We need to come together and have federal legislation that recognizes that the value of humans li human lives needs to be acknowledged and we need that help. We cannot do this alone. And when people come to me and say, Mayor, what are you gonna do about gun violence in the city of Albany? What are you going to do about the lives lost? And we have similar stories here as Mayor Evans just shared. And I say to them, don't come and talk to me about solutions until you're willing to talk about common sense measures to keep illegal guns off of our street. They have to be part of that conversation. In addition to mental health services, in addition to ensuring that we are working in our schools, in addition to bringing in all of government approach to our communities, we have to and we need action around the proliferation of guns in our community. And so I join my fellow mayors in saying we need Congress to act. I join my fellow mayors in saying we need to get serious about funding the services that our communities need, the ones that are plagued by this violence and victimized by this violence. And we need to provide support, support to those who are traumatized by this. Our children are traumatized when they turn on the television. Our children are traumatized when they hear about these incidents that are happening, but our children in our neighborhood in the city of Albany are traumatized when they hear those gunshots ring out right outside their homes. So thank you for bringing attention to this, uh, Mayor Brown. Thank you for bringing us together. And I stand with you and we will work and make sure that we are doing all that we can, particularly this month, to finally bring an end to what is a, 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 a pandemic of gun violence in our community. Mayor Sheehan, for your comments. Now we'll hear from Westchester County Executive George Latimer. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Mayor Brown, for uh, your leadership on this. We grieve with you uh, in past uh, times when we served together in the state legislature. Uh, you know that you have friends all across the state uh, that, that stand behind Buffalo in this moment. But what happened in Buffalo, what happened in Uvalde, what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, could happen anywhere. It could happen in, in, in my backyard next and in anybody else's backyard. And that's why I would say as a county executive, there's a universality in our, uh, in our concern and our commitment. This is an urban problem, but it's also a suburban problem and it's also a rural problem. Uh, the, the, the shooting in Newtown, Connecticut looks like it could have happened in any one of my suburban communities in my home county. And so I think county executives uh, and mayors stand side by side in these things. As Mayor Evans said in, in Rochester, uh, we're at this level of government where the, the problems come right to our front door. We have four of the 15 largest cities in uh, New York State here inside Westchester County. You're gonna hear from Mayor Patterson Howard shortly, Mayor Mike Spano of Yonkers, and also New Rochelle and White Plains, also among the larger cities within our state. Uh, the county government is tasked with mental health services as a local government process and we look forward to working on whatever the best practices are to work closely with our cities and our towns and our villages and to learn how best to use our resources to help that problem wherever it exists in our county in the urban centers and elsewhere. We also have a responsibility within our county police to work cooperatively with all the local police departments to deal with breaking up these rings that bring guns in. And it is frustrating to have state laws. I voted for them as a state senator and a state assembly member, but know that my county is a short drive away from Virginia, a short drive away from Pennsylvania, and people can get a supermarket's worth of guns and put it in the back of their trunk and sell them on the streets of any of our municipalities in the space of a few hours. But we will use that uh, law enforcement uh, effort that we have to work cooperatively and uh, to urge our legislators at, at the federal level to stand behind these uh, these issues. And I, and I know they do already, and sometimes it'll be those of us to reach out to people in other parts of the country. I do think the role of county executives are essential here alongside mayors to make sure people understand this is not just an urban problem, this is also a suburban problem and a rural problem, and we all stand together as colleagues uh, to fight this and push this back. Thank you again for your leadership. Uh, thank you, Westchester County Executive Latimer. Uh, our next speaker is Mount Vernon Mayor Sean Patterson Howard. 
Good morning, Mayor Brown. Thank you so much for bringing us all together. Um, please know that all throughout the state and the country, we continue to pray and support you and the residents of Buffalo and also of Uvalde, Texas, um, after what happened in your communities, the mass shootings in the past few weeks. So just earlier this year in the city of Mount Vernon, we experienced a school lockdown because there were shots fired on the campus of one of our schools. And as school security, uh, the police and, and staff tried to make sure that our young people and our teachers were protected, um, it was a terrorizing moment for our community, whether it was social media or county police coming to assist and to protect and safeguard and lock down the campus. This is something that, you never want to experience. You never want to experience. Thank God we had no injuries and no fatalities, but it did not have to be that way. Parents should never have to wonder if their children are safe in schools. We shouldn't have to wonder if our family and loved ones are safe in church, going to the supermarket, or just walking down the street. It's something that we should not have to deal with. And oftentimes we're seeing this proliferation of violence happening all across our countries, and it feels like it's happening around the country. A shooting in Buffalo feels like a shooting in Mount Vernon. A shooting in Minnesota feels like a shooting in Mount Vernon. And so the anxiety and the mental health and the trauma that is experienced is now experienced nationwide. Um, people really don't understand how real gun violence is until their family, their friends, their community is impacted. They think that it's something that happens somewhere else. But each of our communities are more than a dot on a map. We are communities where people live, work, play, and worship, and we deserve to feel safe. Um, as our communities suffer, it's really twisted that the gun makers um, continue to prosper financially. And they prosper financially because they're protected by senators in the United States Senate who benefit from political and financial backing from the NRA, from the gun lobbyists, from the gun manufacturers who refuse to pass common sense gun laws. And last week as I sat with my co-chairs um, on the Mayors Against Illegal Guns call, we spoke about the amount of violence that we continue to see in our communities and how common sense gun laws can't just be passed on the state level, but they have to be passed on a national level. We have to do something about it. Thoughts and prayers are no longer enough. We need to take action. There are more guns in America, legal and illegal, than there are residents. You can get a gun on a street of an urban or a rural community the way that you can go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. Um, Mount Vernon is the blackest community in New York State, and we're actually the blackest community north of the Mason-Dixon line. And it was very um, sobering. It was it was terrifying to hear that we were on the short list of the Buffalo shooter. We were on the short list as a community. And so, you know, it could have been us. Thank God it was not. You don't want it to be any community. Mount Vernon is working with our local and our state leaders um, to really address gun violence in our communities. We're partnering with our SNUG team, our Youth Bureau, our Youth Shelter of Westchester, and other providers to provide um, employment opportunities. And the state is helping to fin finance that. We wanna make sure that our young people, we're steering them away from a life of crime and guns, and we're giving them an opportunity to have living wage jobs. And we've definitely seen a 14.2% decrease in our violent crimes in Mount Vernon, but one shooting is more, is one too many. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we're not seeing any shootings in our communities. Um, our police department is working very actively with the ATF, with the FBI, with our county police in trying to protect our community and reduce gun violence. We have to make sure that the ATF has their director confirmed um, by our United States Congress and Senate. And lastly, we just have to make sure um, that our schools are safe, that our communities are safe, that our churches are safe, that our families are safe. We do not wanna walk around feeling like we're living, uh, we're dealing with domestic terrorism, we're dealing with urban violence, and we cannot continue to live this way. Common sense gun laws have to be passed. Again, I'll just reiterate, thoughts and prayers are not enough. 
We have to stop deflecting and just talking about mental illness because mental illness is in every country around the world, but no one experiences the level of gun violence that we experience here in America. And that is because of the easy accessibility of guns and the fact that we do not have strict gun laws across our country. So thank you so much again, Mayor Brown. Thank you to all of my fellow mayors across the state and let's work together, especially during this month of gun awareness violence month, um, gun violence awareness month to eliminate gun violence in our communities. God bless everyone. Thank you, Mayor Patterson Howard. God bless you. Our next speaker will be Niagara Falls Mayor Robert Restaino. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Brown, for assembling this press conference. And it's a pleasure to be with all of um, our, my fellow mayors. Um, I'll be brief. I will say to you that um, in order to recognize uh, Gun Violence Awareness Month, we will be lighting um, our world famous falls orange um, to bring attention to this, uh, as has been said, uh, pandemic, epidemic, uh, the problem of gun violence. Um, so much has been said uh, this morning already uh, about the problem that we face. And I would agree, <clears throat> as Mayor Adams indicated and others as well, we need a national solution. Uh, we've seen how patchwork um, uh, attacks uh, or, or addressing things in a patchwork way uh, worked out with regard to COVID-19. Um, we're still fighting that fight. Um, so in the end, this problem needs to be addressed um, at the national level, and as indicated, it needs to be addressed with common sense gun safety laws. You know, even though um, we have strict laws here in New York State, when we take a look back at what happened in this tragic massacre in Buffalo, there's gaps. There are gaps. There are things that fell through the cracks, things that shouldn't have happened that resulted in this tragedy. So we need to also check ourselves to make sure that we in New York State are doing everything we can uh, to protect our residents um, and, and our citizens. You see, Mayor Evans is right. Regardless of whatever happens anywhere, problem Mayor Brown always comes to City Hall, doesn't it? And so in the end, all of us sitting at City Hall want so desperately to fix these problems, but it's bigger than all of us. And so getting us all together today is a great thing. But what we have to do all together is put our voices together and demand change. And I would agree, and I can't remember which speaker said it, it might've been Mayor Evans. Let's look back and say, this was the moment that we decided to not just talk about it, right, Mayor? Thoughts and prayers, but we're gonna do something about it. And just know that the city of Niagara Falls joins with all of you uh, in this effort. Um, Mayor Brown, all you have to do is pick up the phone and call me and I'll be there and do whatever you need me to do. Thank you all for allowing me to participate and let's hope that we can finally get some common sense into this conversation and keep our um, <clears throat> senators and representatives uh, feet to the fire. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Mayor Restaino. Uh, next, we will hear from Niagara Falls, pardon me, from Dunkirk Mayor Wilfred Rosas. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for including me uh, today. And I also agree with all the speakers. This is an issue that is too big for any one community to take on. I appreciate you bringing all of us together. Uh, and I know that this is only a start. This is where we begin the process. This is, this is a bigger issue. Uh, than any one of us can take on. Uh, the city of Dunkirk is a small city. It's the westernmost city uh, in the state. And yet we also experience violence, uh, gun violence that way. What for me is uh, important for us to understand is that, you know, I'm a retired New York State trooper. And uh, before I was allowed in the academy to even fire a weapon, uh, I needed to go through all this training and yet none of that exists for anyone that wants to go out and purchase an automatic weapon such as an AR-15. These are just plain common sense policies that should be in place. The process should include a mental health evaluation, a background check, 
uh, safety courses should be taken. Um, I know that in New York State, to drive a vehicle, it's a privilege, not a right. Uh, you have to take these courses to even get a permit. You have to take a test and pass it. Then you have to show that you can actually drive the vehicle. Uh, but that's not the case here for purchasing a weapon. Uh, so these are basic things that we should be looking at. And again, I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but I want to let um, all of my colleagues here today know that the city of Dunkirk is on board and we will do whatever we can to help this coalition achieve its goal. Um, I know that we're going to be, if we move forward with this coalition, we're going to need to fund it somehow. And that would be where I would be focusing my, my attention on is how we could actually fund this because the other side already has that measure in place. So this is going to be important for us as we move forward. Again, I thank all of my colleagues in government uh, participating today and I hope that this coalition continues to grow. Thank you. Mayor Rosas, thank you for joining us today. Uh, our final elected um, representative speaker will be Yonkers Mayor Mike Spano. Good morning, uh, Mayor Brown. Uh, the people of Yonkers, New York State's the third largest city, uh, we want to offer our condolences, obviously, to you. Uh, to the people of Buffalo, because um, your continued grief that you've been going through. Uh, I also want to say thank you to uh, New York City Mayor Adams for his words. His words are important because for a long time we have been at this discussion talking about, uh, you know, gun violence in America. For a long time we have said, let's pass common sense legislation. Uh, for a long time, people have said, well, you know, you, politically, it's, only, it's so difficult to do. And yet, you don't have to look far. You have to go back to 9-11. When the World Trade Center were knocked down, um, this country went into action. Greatest country, the strongest military in the world. But this country spent a trillion dollars on a war. This country put in place an entire new department and hired 50, 60,000 TSA officers. When this country decides it wants to do something, it happens and it can happen. This tragic events that took place in Buffalo, now in Texas, and we've seen all too often all happen across America, horrifies us. We all have this horrific feeling. I, I, I haven't, I have yet to be able to watch a full news program on it because it just breaks your heart. But I dare say that there are mass shootings happening in America every single day, except they're happening on the streets of our cities. And we need to be just as horrified. And we need to have the same resolve each and every single day when this happens. Common sense legislation, yes, that's important. But also keeping in mind that it has to be national because we need a national approach because, you know, you look at the places, frankly, they have the toughest gun laws and we still have the issues with gun violence. New York State's talking about, uh, you know, outlawing ghost guns. Well, you know, they're ghost guns. They shouldn't be there anyway, right? That's why they call them ghost guns. Uh, the, uh, you know, they want to talk about the fingerprinting or finger, uh, some type of fingerprint on the bullets. I mean, that's how far New York has gone to, to fight gun violence. Yet our cities are still plagued with it because of the loose laws that exist nationally. So I hear in today, I'm here today in solidarity with the mayors all across America calling for common sense reform nationally calling for uh, resources to be made available to, to cities like ours. Because you know what? The mayors, we're the ones on the front lines. We're the run, ones who are, are seeing the victims each and every single day because it happens each and every single day. 
they're saying that there are as many as 40 uh, people, mostly young men, who are dying in the streets of American cities every single day. By tomorrow, 12 noon, be another 40 people. And the day after that, another 40 people. When does it end? It ends when we have the collective resolve as a country to say enough is enough. And let's pass these laws. We're looking at common sense laws. Let's take it and let's get it done. And we can only get it done if we continue to be horrified, each and every one of us together and have that resolve to get it done. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Spano, thank you very much for your comments. We're now going to ask Reverend Paul Thomas, the pastor of Bethel AME Church, to close our statewide call in prayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as we gather together and close out uh, this event in prayer, uh, we look to God. We are reminded of Exodus, where it says, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I pray that we are consciously aware of this mandate to love each other. If you love yourself and if you love God and if you love your family, then love me too. This is the command that we find in Exodus. May the wealthy find common ground in loving the poor. May the strong find common ground in loving the weak. May those who struggle with mental health concerns and issues uh, be just as loved on by those who have things ironed out and together. May this love transcend into our schools. May it transcend into our homes. May it transcend into our places of worship and our culture. May there be a love ethic that helps us to be accountable for those persons who are presently alive today, knowing that those persons and their concerns and their weights are just as important as those who have it together. We thank God for these mayors. We thank God for these commissioners. We thank God for these representatives. And we thank God for these panelists. May our efforts reflect in orange. May it reflect so that awareness might be brought to the effect of gun violence. This is our prayer. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Thomas. I also want to thank all of the mayors across New York State, elected officials across New York State, gun violence prevention advocates who have joined us in person and who have joined us uh, remotely. I want to thank faith leaders uh, who have joined us all uh, resolved to do something to bring an end to gun violence, not only in the state of New York, but all across this nation. We thank everyone who has been a part of this call today, who has watched this call today, and we are committed to linking arms and working in common purpose and in common cause to end gun violence in the United States of America. Thank you all very much. Uh, we hope and pray that the Supreme Court will look at these mass shootings uh, for different reasons uh, that they have occurred all across the United States of America, literally hundreds of mass shootings, uh, and make the right decision. Um, 
lighting uh, buildings and landmarks in, in orange is just part of the process of raising awareness about gun violence and asking the members of our community here in Buffalo, all across the state of New York, and all across the nation to join together uh, in this effort to end gun violence in our communities, uh, in this state, and in our nation. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, is Mayor Evans still on this call? He is not. Berkeley, I will forward your question, um, but I will uh, repeat it for oh. Mayor Brown and anyone else uh, who'd like to uh, speak to this. Um, a question we often get is where do guns come from? Each gun with a serial number has trace data, information on where it was made, sold, resold, or stolen. However, when I ask for, for trace data on guns confiscated in Rochester, local, state, and federal law enforcement tell me it's not theirs to share. They don't do it or it's not public information. Do you think the public has the right to know specifically where the guns come from and how they got it to the streets? Do you think it does have a right to know where guns fr come from? The public should know uh, where, where guns come from. Uh, and in Buffalo and many cities across the state, uh, we do make that information available. Uh, it is frightening, uh, it is horrifying. Uh, during my time as mayor of the city of Buffalo, we have removed thousands and thousands and thousands of guns uh, from the streets of, of this city. Uh, Linda Beagle Shulman, a gun uh, violence prevention advocate uh, talked about the iron pipe pipeline uh, with guns flowing in, into communities uh, from other states whose gun laws are not as restrictive as the state of New York and other states uh, in this nation. We have very strong gun laws in New York State and unfortunately because there is not a national standard. Um, uh, we have guns that flow from other states in this country and cause death and disaster in communities like Buffalo and communities across the country. Linda, I don't know if you want to respond to that as well. It's for sure. There are so many guns that are coming in from what they call the Iron Pipeline, and we have to stop that. And the only way we're going to stop that is with federal legislation. There is no reason that illegal guns should be coming into any state or going, be, be out there at all. We have to stop the selling. We have to stop um, ghost guns, especially ghost guns, if I may. Ghost gu I ask you, what do you own that doesn't have a serial number? Your car, your washer, your dryer, your, your phone, um, your video game. A can of food has, has a serial number on it so that we could trace it back if something's wrong. Your clothing has a tag on it. Why should a firearm not have a serial number? It, it, it's a weapon that can't be traceable. Who wants to buy a ghost gun? Someone who can't pass a background check or someone who has something in their mind to do to harm someone. We have to have federal legislation passed so that every state has the same rule, so you can't get guns from another state coming into New York or guns from, from any, any state going into any other state. Unless we stop that, we are not going to stop this epidemic of gun violence. And this is something we have to do. And this can be done. We have to keep at our elected officials and make sure either they hear us and they do something about it, or else we need to get rid of them and we need to do our homework and forget about voting across all red or all blue. Do your homework. Find out what the person who wants to be elected or re-elected, what they believe in, especially when it comes to gun safety, and then vote for that person. People say, how are we going to do this? We're going to do this by keeping our voices heard and getting rid of those people who don't believe in gun safety, instead believe in owning their guns and getting money from whether it's the NRA or whatever organization Okay, that is going to give them money who does not believe in gun safety. Kay Bain is a, another leading voice 
for gun violence prevention. I'd like to give him the opportunity Absolutely. to respond to that. Thank you, Mayor. I remember recently we were at the White House, and I overheard a statistic. They said that 90 percent of the illegal guns come from 5 percent of the dealers who are distributing these guns. That's something that can be and should be addressed. But I want to go back to, to a previous question about lighting up municipalities in orange and the purpose of that. Lynn and I were speaking earlier about the need for an increase in awareness, for dialogue and conversation. We're talking about common sense legislation, but apparently common sense is not common. And so in this country, we have to have more in-depth, informed conversations about what exactly is happening and how it affects every single individual in this country. You have 40,000 people dying annually by firearms, preventable deaths that are happening, 80,000 people being shot. And we're still talking about, you know, common sense legislation, kind of ridiculous, something that I want to offer as a tool for the, the municipalities around the state, right? We're, we're doing something in New York City called Safe Summer 22. And it's a three-pronged approach to addressing what has historically been an uptick in violence um, in communities. So the first thing we're looking to do in state jurisdictions is to strategically plan. I read somewhere that 86% of nonprofits spend less than one hour a month strategically planning. Well, let's do something different with violence. Let's sit there and, and sit together and look at where are we going to expect violence to occur? What key individuals, what key events should we monitor, should we be at? That is strategic planning. The second pillar is cross-collaboration. We should be looking for unlikely community stakeholders, businesses to invest and sponsor pushing peace forward. We have to create this conversation and expand community stakeholders. So unlikely community stakeholders, listen, violence affects all of us. The children in schools, when the seat is empty, the households, everyone is affected. So we have to, again, engage in community on another level. The third and final pillar of Safe Summer 22 is about recruitment of volunteers. Because again, everyone has a role to play in keeping neighborhoods safe. So we want to go out and find volunteers. And what are their skill sets? How could they be involved, invested? I think what we've seen is when we do these three things, there is a decrease and decline in violence. So there are things that we should and can be doing in communities to de-escalate the violence. Thank you all very much. We appreciate the members of the media that joined us for this important statewide call on Gun Violence Awareness Month and what we collectively have committed to doing uh, to ending gun violence in our state and in our nation. Thank you. Recording.